paradox of viruses. Where did they come from? When does chemistry become biochemistry? When does matter become life? What is the origin of cells? Cellular life emerged on Earth almost 4 billion years ago, but we don't know how or why. One theory suggests that the oily membrane came first. All can form self-sealing bubbles that hold things together. This allows complex molecules like nucleic acids to form inside. Another theory suggests that the metabolism of energy came first. How could living things form and reproduce if they didn't have a fuel source? All cells use the same fundamental chemical reaction to generate usable energy, converting glucose into ATP. Perhaps this process is the origin of life, which then evolved self-replicating molecules, enclosed cells, and finally life as we know it. Another theory suggests that all these processes were brought together by clay, which acted as a catalyst to speed up the formation of self-replicating molecules. Another theory suggests that life began on underwater volcanic events, which provided the energy, material and environment for self-replication. Another theory suggests that life came together between layers of freezing ice. Another theory suggests that life came to Earth as stowaways on an interstellar meteor. But panspermia leaves more questions than answers. How did life begin on other planets? And how the heck did it survive the journey here? Another theory, perhaps the most popular of the century, suggests that RNA came first. Since all living things reproduce, self-replicating molecules must have been the origin of life. DNA cannot replicate by itself. It requires an army of robot-like proteins to pull the two strands apart and help them copy. But you can't make new proteins without DNA, and you can't make new DNA without proteins. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? The protein machinery which builds DNA or the DNA blueprints to build proteins? To resolve this paradox, scientists suggested that perhaps RNA could perform the role of both. RNA can be single-stranded and flexible like proteins and contain genetic information like DNA. Interesting idea, but where is the evidence? The first RNA capable of catalyzing chemical reactions was found by accident only a few decades ago. It was found in a single-celled pond algae with seven different genders and 21 mating combinations. That RNA molecule was by itself able to cut up chains of genetic RNA, and others were able to glue them back together in different combinations. But that was just one weird RNA in an even weirder polygendered cell. More evidence came in the year 2000 when the structure of the protein-making factories and cells, called ribosomes, was discovered. While most of the factory is made of protein, the whole process is directed by RNA. RNA carries the instruction from the genome, whether cellular or viral, reads the order forms and oversees the production. These RNA-directed ribosomes are in every living cell and are responsible for building the protein shell of every virus. Due to its multifunctionality, universal involvement in cells and viruses, and relative simplicity, Perhaps RNA is the first ancestor of both cells and viruses. However, only very simple RNA molecules have been observed to self-replicate completely, and only in very specific laboratory environments. While this is still the leading theory for the origin of life, more and more issues have been identified in recent years. Viral world. If the origin of cells is unclear, the origin of viruses is murkier still. Viruses are too small and fragile to leave any fossil evidence. The exception is type 6 retroviruses, who copy some of their genetic code into the DNA of living cells. In the case of multicellular organisms such as ourselves, this is only passed on to successive generations when an egg or sperm cell is infected by the virus. The human genome is now about 8% virus and growing. This also occurs with plants and fungi. Paleovirology is the burgeoning study of extinct viruses found in living cells. While we may never understand the origin of viruses, there are a few main theories. They may have come from genetic material that escaped from cells and got progressively more complex. They may have come from parasitic cells that got less complex and eventually lost their ability to self-replicate. They may have come from the same precellular ancestor but evolved along a different path. RNA that merged with oil bubbles became cells, and RNA that consumed the bubble, then moved on, became viruses. Viruses may even be the missing link between an RNA world and the first living cell. 
Different types of viruses infect species on all branches of the tree of life. Does that mean that viruses sprang up independently on each branch? Or viruses existed since before the trunk split? Maybe both. But one theory takes it a step further and suggests that viruses were the seed of the tree of life, that viruses existed before cells. This immediately runs into a few issues. If viruses are dependent on cells to generate energy, build proteins and reproduce, then how could they possibly predate cells? But the same could be asked of the first living cell. Before you dismiss the viral origin of life offhand, let me try to explain. If life began as a simple self-replicating RNA, it copied itself by attaching to other bits of floating RNA. Perhaps it then merged with some simple proteins and, like a ribosome, evolved the ability to make more proteins. Such protein enzymes may have given it the ability to metabolize energy from its environment, build cell walls and eventually become a full-fledged cell. But before it could do all of this, wasn't it just a bunch of parasitic RNA? Before it became fully alive, was the first simple cell really so different from a virus? Consider, for example, viroids. Viroids are like tiny viruses without even a protein shell, let alone a cell of its own. They are all a circular ring of RNA, only a few hundred nucleic acids long, that infects mostly plants. Doesn't the spontaneous evolution of a simple viroid seem more likely than a complex living cell? Perhaps these first genetic replicators lived off the energy and nucleic acids of their environment rather than off cells, but were otherwise similar to modern day viruses. Once they learned to replicate, they gradually evolved in complexity until they had a shell, then ribosomes, then metabolisms, and finally a whole cell. Furthermore, most bacteria and prokaryotes, some of the oldest types of cells, have circular chromosomes like viroids. Some viral chromosomes are circular, and some are linear like our own. Are viruses and viroids the missing link in the origin of cells? So that is the theory, but where is the evidence? Firstly, all viruses are very different from cells. Most viruses share proteins that are not found in any cells. If viruses evolved after cells, wouldn't we expect to find these proteins in at least some cells? Secondly, all viruses are very similar to each other, suggesting that they came from the same ancient ancestor. Some vastly different viruses use identical protein enzymes to replicate. Furthermore, all viruses use one of only several capsid templates and use the same protein to build them. Even some RNA and some DNA viruses share identical capsid structures. A recent study examined the functional similarities of folding proteins rather than their underlying genetic code. Proteins from thousands of viruses and cell species were compared by algorithm and hundreds of protein fold structures were found in both viruses and cells. However, 66 different fold structures were found only in viruses. Many of these relate to the capsid structure and its ability to break into cells. Another study found fold structures that appear to predate the split of the tree of life. From this common ancestor of both cells and viruses, bacteria increased in complexity while viruses gradually shed unneeded genes until they could no longer reproduce on their own. According to this theory, viruses were not the origin of life but evolved interdependently since before the last common cellular ancestor. Of course, these similarities could be the result of horizontal gene transfer between contemporary vi viruses rather than from a common ancestor. It could also be the result of convergent evolution from similar selection pressures. And while many viruses are similar, no gene has been found that is common to all viruses. Cells, on the other hand, all share certain genes and functions, lending more weight to the claim that they share a common ancestor. It may be difficult to accept that viruses share a common ancestor that existed before modern cells, but the alternatives seem equally unlikely. Were these, these shared genes transferred horizontally from virus to virus across all environments on the planet until they were more numerous than the stars in the observable universe? Or did these genes, as well as the viruses themselves, spontaneously evolve independently of each other multiple times in exactly the same way? Other evidence for the viral origin of cell involves DNA. All cells carry their genetic code in DNA, whereas viruses use DNA or RNA. If replication started with RNA, how did it evolve into the first DNA? 
One theory suggests that an ancient RNA virus converted to DNA to protect itself from the cell it lived within. The conversion enzyme was randomly acquired but became widespread through natural selection. Another cell then used viral DNA as a template to copy and store its own genome. Such an enzyme was first discovered in HIV, a type 6 RNA retrovirus, but it is also common in many cells. Alternatively, RNA viruses may have provided selection pressure for cells to protect their genome by converting it to DNA. DNA viruses then later evolved to continue infecting these now DNA cells. Like an arms race, cells were trying to keep one step ahead and viruses were trying to catch up. Finally, certain nucleic acid bases that are only found in some viruses can still be read by cellular ribosomes and converted into enzymes for their own production. Why would this be the case unless they involved interdependently? Since viruses bridge the gap between RNA and DNA, perhaps they also bridge the gap between an RNA world and the first DNA genome. Even if viruses were not the origin of all living cells, they may still be the origin of certain cells. Eukaryotic cells, like those in all animals, plants and fungi, took over a billion years to evolve since the last common ancestor of all cells. They are much bigger and more specialised. According to the leading theory, called endosymbiosis, one cell engulfed another, but instead of digesting it, they began to live together in harmony. Mitochondria are the energy-making factory of all multicellular organisms and are believed to have evolved from an energetic bacteria. Chloroplasts are the energy-capturing solar panels of plant cells and are believed to have evolved from a light-sensitive bacteria. They are still the same size as bacteria and both carry their own DNA separate from the host cell. The DNA of these large cells is stored all together in a separate nucleus, unlike the previous cells where it was spread throughout. A dense collection of genetic material without the machinery to build things is reminiscent of a virus. One theory suggests that eukaryotic cells are the result of a merger between multiple bacteria and a virus to form the nucleus. If this is true, then the origin of all plants and animals is viral. Maybe even all cells evolve from a virus. Escaped fragments. If viruses are not the origin of cells, they must have come from cells. One theory suggests that after the last common cellular ancestor was already established, viruses evolved from gene fragments that escaped from larger genomes. If these fragments were able to replicate at the expense of the cell, then escape from their host, they could evolve by natural selection. They may have started like simple viroids of RNA and gradually evolved into more complex DNA viruses. The genome of all organisms contains genetic fragments that move around within and can even jump between species. Such mobile genetic elements make up about half of the human genome and show remarkable similarities with retroviruses. It is not too much of a stretch to imagine them evolving further into viruses, especially since they don't have to develop the ability to metabolize, build proteins or replicate by themselves. A well-documented example of a new virus being created through gene escape is the human hepatitis delta virus. It contains an RNA enzyme that is very similar to a common fragment of RNA replication in the human genome. The virus is only found in humans already infected with the hepatitis B virus and probably evolved from human and viral fragments merging. Similarly, viruses that infect only fungi share many proteins with their host cell suggesting co-divergence. But such similarities between virus and host are not usually the case. This theory does not explain why most viruses use proteins not found in any cells. It does not explain why some viruses that infect only bacteria have proteins that are more similar to those found in eukaryotic cells than those in the bacteria they infect. But if the last common ancestor of viruses existed before the tree of life split, then these issues dissolve. Reduced cells. Another theory for the origin of viruses suggests that they came from a lineage of cells that reduced themselves until they became viruses. A once autonomous organism developed a symbiotic relationship with the larger cell. Over time, or perhaps quickly, the relationship became parasitic. The little cell benefited more than the big cell, and the relationship was no longer equal. But this came at a cost for the little cell, 
it became dependent on the big cell for more and more of its functions. If you don't use it, you lose it, and the little cell gradually lost its unused genes. Eventually, the once free-living parasite became dependent on the big cell even to reproduce. This is basically a virus. In support of this theory, there are several cells known to have regressed in complexity and become dependent on bigger cells. For example, mitochondria and chloroplasts inside cells are both believed to have evolved from more complex autonomous organisms. Human mitochondria still carry 37 of their own genes, all of which are essential, whittled down from about 3,000 genes from its ancestor. The smallest known cellular genome has been reduced to only 137 genes. While Nausea delta cephonicola can make essential amino acids for the insects it lives within, this symbiotic bacteria cannot reproduce by itself nor metabolize energy in the normal cellular way. This shows how organisms can rely on other cells for certain functions and jettison unused genes. It also blurs the line between a viral and cellular parasite. But are mitochondria really a parasite? They make the energy and the cell uses it to carry out the other functions. They are a codependent team. Incidentally, mitochondrial DNA is only passed down from mothers, and all living humans inherited it from the same mother who lived in Africa about 200,000 years ago. However, there are similar examples involving true parasites. Rickettsia is a parasitic bacteria spread by ticks that causes typhus fever and was long thought to be a virus because it cannot reproduce by itself. But it is now believed to have evolved from a more complex self-replicating bacteria. Rickettsia shares many genes with mitochondria and lacks many of the same genes essential for independent living. They may even share a common ancestor. Similarly, chlamydia is a sexually transmitted bacteria that is believed to share a common ancestor with chloroplasts. Both of these parasitic bacteria contain about a thousand genes and can metabolize their own energy but cannot reproduce outside of host cells. The parasitic bacteria that cause leprosy and tuberculosis are believed to have also shared a common ancestor. They are very similar in size and shape and have about 1,500 genes in common. Of the two, the leprosy bacteria took an evolutionary path of reduced genetic complexity. Other than the shared genes, the leprosy bacteria has only about 100 additional genes, whereas the tuberculosis bacteria has over 2,000. More than half of the leprosy-inducing genome is now made of non-functional genomes, which, while still more efficient than humans, is very inefficient by bacterial standards. It has less than half the genetic efficiency and half the number of functional genes compared to the tuberculosis bacteria. Perhaps this is the result of genetic mutation or decay of unused but as yet undeleted genes. Since it appears to have co-evolved with humans only relatively recently, this seems more likely. Unsurprisingly, the leprosy bacteria is dependent on its host cell for more functions than its tuberculosis counterpart. Since none of these bacteria examples can reproduce outside of their host cell, are they really so different from viruses? Some final examples of use it or lose it evolution can be found even in humans. There are 20 amino acids essential to all life, but only 11 of them can be made by human cells. To get the remaining 9 amino acids, it is essential that we eat plants or eat animals that already ate plants. Bacteria, fungi, and the common ancestor that we shared can make all of them. Since animals have been eating plants for billions of years, we lost the need to make any of the amino acids and lost the ability to make almost half of them. Similarly, but more recently, some mammals lost one of the multiple enzymes necessary to convert glucose into vitamin C. Almost all species can make their own vitamin C, but a random DNA mutation about 60 million years ago lost us that ability along with primates, bats, and guinea pigs. Since our common, ancestor, so common ancestors were eating a varied diet with sufficient vitamin C, they kept calm and carried on replicating that mutation. There was not enough selection pressure to remove it from the genome, whereas plants would die without it. Now vitamin C pills make over US $1 billion per year annually, globally. So just like humans lost the ability to make vitamin C and all the amino acids, maybe 
Cells lost the ability to metabolize and reproduce independently and became viruses. And since there are parasitic cells that can't do these things either, what's the difference? Humans are dependent on eating cells, while viruses are dependent on infecting cells. Giant cells. Further evidence for the regressive evolution of cells into viruses comes from giant viruses that resemble parasitic bacteria. They may be a missing link in the evolution from cell to virus. The first giant virus was discovered in a water tower in England, but it was so big that it was believed to be a bacteria for over a decade. When they finally realized it was a virus, they said it had been mimicking bacteria and called it mimivirus. While the smallest known cellular genome contains 137 genes, the mimivirus has almost 1,000, and most of these genes are unlike anything found in living cells. With these extra genes, the virus can provide more parts of the machinery for replicating, something that was previously considered a hallmark of living cells. But it cannot complete the whole process alone, suggesting that these extra genes may be remnants of a previously complete system. While smaller cellular parasites tend to be more dependent on their host, bigger viral parasites tend to perform more of their own functions. And where small cells and big viruses overlap on the continuum, they are remarkably similar. An even bigger virus was later discovered with over 2,500 genes and was dubbed Pandora virus. It has five times more genes than the simplest free-living bacteria and 500 times more genes than the simplest virus. Influenza virus, for example, has less than 14. Is Pandora virus more similar to the influenza virus or the rickettsia bacteria? Or neither. Over 90% of its 2,500 genes do not resemble any lineages found on Earth, neither cellular nor viral, not even other giant viruses. Searching for the origin of viruses may expose more mysteries in the tree of life than it solves. Are we ready to open Pandora's box? The biggest virus currently known to science is the pithovirus. It is 50% wider than Pandora virus, but contains only one-fifth as many genes. Furthermore, two-thirds of its 500 genes are unlike any known virus, even other giant viruses. It was discovered in dirt that had been frozen in Siberia for over 30,000 years, but then woke up and became infectious again. Pithovirus is bigger than the smallest eukaryotic cell and is even big enough to be infected by a virus itself. In a water tower in Paris, they found an amoeba infected by a giant virus with 1,000 genes, itself infected by a tiny satellite virus dubbed Sputnik. Sputnik has only 21 genes and requires both the larger virus and the amoeba to reproduce. Most of these genes are unlike any other known genes although several are closely related to the virus it infects. This further blurs the boundary between cells and viruses. Origins It is only natural that we are curious about where life came from and where the coronavirus came from, but it is a Pandora's box of mysteries that, if understood, will leave you with more questions than answers. If viruses evolved from cells, then why are even giant viruses so different from even the smallest of cellular parasites? No virus has been found with a ribosome or the ability to metabolize ATP, yet all cells can do this. And if viruses did not evolve from cells, then where did they come from? Giant viruses use double helix DNA, as do all cells, while coronavirus uses single-stranded RNA. Why are there so many different types of virus? One explanation for why the origin of viruses is so unclear is that there were multiple origins. Maybe giant viruses regress from parasitic cells and simple viruses like Sputnik progress from escaped DNA fragments. Maybe viruses emerged before the first cell, then again after the tree of life split. Maybe all of these things happened and more. This could help explain the diversity we find in virus lineages. Ultimately, the origin of viruses may be a matter of definition more than anything else. Replicating RNA probably existed before fully formed modern cells, but does that qualify as a virus? Conversely, modern viruses could only exist after the ribosomes who built their protein shells, but does a ribosome qualify as a cell? Either way, viruses have co-evolved with cells for a long time, 
and are intimately intertwined with the tree of life.